Good morning, welcome to Restore's online service again today. We are looking at 1 Corinthians um, and we'll be looking today particularly about guarding against divisions in the church. So let's just start by praying together. Father God, we thank you that the church is your plan. It's your intention to be um, an embodiment of you in our world. God, we just come this morning to spend some time listening to your design for the church. Father, we open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us individually, but also collectively for the body of church that we're a part of. God, I pray for over the words that I share today that they will be of you and anything that's not of you um, and more of me. Father, I pray that you will just wash away what's not needed and help us to hear the words that you have to say today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we've been looking at 1 Corinthians. We've been looking at the whole letter. Um, I know we've been having pieces together, and I think it's really mindful that we do read the letter as one whole thing. And remember that Paul wrote the letter in response to a letter that he'd received. Um, So we've got to remember the context of what we're reading um, in 1 Corinthians. We need to remember who it's for, why it was written, um, what it meant to them, Um, And then on that, we can think and say, God, what does it mean for us today? Um, We know that Paul spent 18 months in Corinth during his travels. He was um, passionate to tell people about this amazing Jesus and what had happened and how life can be. While in his time in Corinth, he'd established a group of people that were keen to learn and get to know Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit and walk in the way that God wants for them. So this was church. This was the beginnings of church. This were people coming together to work this out together, to learn more together, to get to know God more, and to be more God to the people around them, be more like Jesus to those around them. Um, We'd heard about Corinth, that it was actually a kind of metropolis, this cosmopolitan city with... um, port harbours, Uh, it had a trade and industry coming through for many, many areas. Therefore, it developed this culture of being a real multicultural uh, city, Uh, many languages, many beliefs that had come from across the sea and being shared. Um, And actually, there was a real drive that I discovered in my research of this. There was a real drive of um, a culture of promiscuity. And actually, it became known as a city of promiscuity. Um, It was a city that was driving after pleasure and prosperity. And actually, even though this letter was written around 50 AD, we're talking nearly 2,000 years ago, the environment that it was written for, this multicultural, this multilanguage, this multi-belief, this uh, city full of drive for pleasure, prosperity, money, income, doesn't feel too different to the world around me, particularly, um, and and the environment that we live in in this area. So actually, there is a lot for us to relate to, and the issues that were raised by the church at that time still has a relevance to a lot of the issues we've got now. And that makes me really sad, actually, that 2,000 years on, we're still facing the same problems. Why we've not learned, why we've not improved, is a question we'll have to chat with God more on because this this feels like we're not making the progress we should in these fundamental issues. We're particularly looking today at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10 to 12. Before that, in the verses 1 to 9, Paul had given this introduction. Um, He'd explained um, himself, he'd introduced himself and the, the purpose of the letter in response to a letter from them raising some of these issues. So by verse 10, he's had his introduction. This is the first issue that he addresses in the letter. Verse 10 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there were quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, and still another, I follow Christ. So this is the first issue that's been brought to Paul's attention. 
And actually, I'm not sure, have a think in terms of the church that you're a part of, I'm not sure we've got that issue in Restore right now where people are saying, oh, I'm only going to listen to this person. I'm going to follow Ian. I'm not going to follow anybody else's thoughts. Um, I'm only going to follow Malcolm or I'm only following Simon. I don't feel like that's necessarily a front and centre issue for us. But I do feel that we can relate to the problem that they had there. In Corinth, they had these different styles of leadership. They had a variety of these people, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, that were very different people, very different backgrounds. You had educated, non-educated, Greek, Jewish, local, traveller. But actually, the same Jesus was being shared, but in the different characteristics, through the different personalities of the leaders, in a different mannerism of sharing and speaking. And I think how that relates to us is that we can fall into the trap of saying, I prefer church to look like this. I prefer worship, speaking to be this way and this manner. And and how much do we follow our preferences? And then actually, how much does that have a dangerous ground of becoming divisions and having oppositions. Um, and we may not have the kind of standout arguments about these sort of things that it sounds like the Corinthians were having. But actually, is there an element of division underneath there um, in terms of are we edifying the church as one body or are we sowing any elements of division and following our preferences over following Jesus? I feel that when I looked at the whole book of Corinthians, Paul actually didn't just deal with this issue in those two verses, move on. But actually the first three chapters, as they're broken up for us, he didn't write it in chapters, he wrote it as one letter. The first three chapters seem to really emphasise this message and focus the whole issue across that time. He starts with opening, as I said at the introduction, and the very... Said the second verse, chapter 1, verse 2, to the God, church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I feel that right at the beginning of his letter, when Paul was addressing this issue, he came in with a strong reminder that if you're part of the church of Christ, you're part of the whole church of Christ and in addressing any issues in the church we need to be looking bigger and thinking we are part of the whole perspective let's look up from our nitty-gritty I've got an issue with this thing let's look up and say actually I'm part of this big picture remembering we're part of something bigger verse three Paul reminds us that the grace and peace comes from God and that's a key fundamental element in terms of addressing issues within the church we've got to be functioning through the grace and peace that comes from God in that and verse four I loved this and on a Sunday and Loughton Suzanne shared this with us in our opening um, talk of the, of the unit that's saying verse four Paul makes a deliberate point of being thankful for everyone in the church. Now, he's writing this letter knowing that there are divisions, there are upsets, there are disputes going on, but he's very intentional about saying, I am thankful to God for every one of you. And that includes those people that might be stirring up discontent or stirring up arguments. And I think that in terms of addressing issues in a church, to come with the grace and peace from God, to come knowing that we are part of a big picture, the whole globe, global church and to come with a thankfulness that for every single member of the church in our in our local unit I think is a really good starting point that Paul was reminding us of then again went into verse 10 and shared those verses we just looked at then from verse 13 to 31 Paul continues to go on and talking about what is the point in arguing over who speaks best, but actually really reinforcing that we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. We've got to be united in sharing Jesus. That's the main point. It doesn't matter who says it which way and how, but actually there needs to be a unity in keeping the main purpose, sharing Jesus to those around us. Paul then continues on with this issue through chapter 2. He clarifies that he was only ever good at sharing Jesus because he was fueled by the Holy Spirit. 
And actually, the important in verse 15 and 16 goes on to talk about we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the mind of Christ. Now, for me, that jumped out at me. Because I think if the spirit we've got living in us is the spirit of Jesus that walked on the land, and we saw how Jesus treated people, we saw how he looked at people that were hurting and rejected, um, those that were outcast. And if we have that same spirit in us, are we living in that spirit and viewing other people as Jesus views them? So I really was, I felt that chapter 2 was really reinforcing that need to live in the Holy Spirit, to see others through the Holy Spirit. And actually, at the beginning of chapter 3, Paul actually kind of chastises the Corinthians and saying, you're acting like babies in the Holy Spirit. You're requiring people to spoon-feed you everything. And actually, there is a call to mature in the Holy Spirit, to actually process things for ourselves, to look at where we need to improve, and actually to tune in more to the Holy Spirit and see people more in that way. Paul then goes through chapter 3 and gives some really good examples, and I haven't got time to go through all of them in depth, but definitely have a good look at chapter 3 again, because he goes back to the same issue and really re-emphasizes that this is what he's been talking about the whole time. In chapter 3, verse 4, he says, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? He's just talked about living in the Holy Spirit. And he's going, this is a human issue. This whole bickering over preferences, that's a human issue. Are you living in the Holy Spirit in this bit? Are you seeing what the Holy Spirit sees? He gives us some solutions. Chapter 3, verse 5 to 15, he reminds us that we're co-workers in God's service. He said that I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. We have a part to play, and we each have a part. And it's not that one's better than another, the whole imagery of the body of of the church. And actually, Paul is urging us to consider our part in the whole, that big church picture. You have a part to play in it. You're part of something bigger. Verses um, 16 and 17, Paul reminds us that we're God's temple. You are housing the Holy Spirit inside you. So if you are housing the Holy Spirit inside you, you are carrying the presence of God. You are now a house of God. Therefore, you are the temple of God, your body, your being. So therefore, are we housing the Holy Spirit in the right way? And are we viewing each other as that house, that temple of the Holy Spirit? Are we looking to build them up? Or are we looking to nitpick and destroy and attack? And that doesn't each go just for individuals who are followers of Christ. Are we building each other up? But also the collective house of God. We as individuals create the house of God. We create the church. So are we looking to build up the church? Or are we looking to nitpick and find our preferences and find things that don't go the way we think? and actually end up destroying the house of God. In verse 18 and 22 of chapter 3, Paul talks about there's no point boasting in yourself or your leaders, but actually it's only through the Holy Spirit that we are empowered to do what's right. And actually we need to become wiser in the Spirit, not be fools. Verse 23, you need to remember that you are in God. There's no point boasting in humans and leaders, but boast in God. He talks about all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Everything is in God. So is there point us bickering over things, but actually remembering that we are in the Holy Spirit, bringing it through the Holy Spirit seeking him in all things. So for me, there are those three messages. Remembering you're part of something bigger. To live in the Holy Spirit and to be united together in sharing Jesus. I'm going to look at those three a bit more in terms of what does that mean then for us? 
And firstly, I absolutely love this topic of messy church because for me, I have a strong feeling that church will be messy. Um, and actually, if our church isn't messy and we don't have messy people in it, are we reaching the right people? Humans, all of us, we come with mess. And actually, if you look around on your Sunday morning and everybody's all looking lovely contained and all tidy and clean and no outspilling of emotion or mess or even any kind of element of conflict or disagreement, then actually we're just hanging out with people that are very much together and the same of us and we're all agreeing. But that seems very comfortable. But actually, if we are seeking that Jesus impacts the community around us, if we are wanting the people around us to get to know God more, they're going to walk in and seek after God, and I pray they do, but they're going to come in with all the mess of them. I know that every single person in a church carries some element of mess, whether it's beautifully hidden or it's quite publicly open. We each carry mess and sin and baggage um, that we just, because we're not perfect. We're humans. We haven't got it perfected. Even our leaders, we all are not yet perfect. So we come with an element of mess. There will be disagreements. There will be differences of opinion. Um, but actually, there will be people that also carry hurt, pain, rejection, trauma, isolation, fear, anger. And some of us will hide that really beautifully inside and contain it. And some of us will just bring it all out on the front of us. <laughs> and you walk in the room and you can feel it and sense it. And you probably have all come up against somebody in your daily life that is kind of carrying their mess quite publicly out there because they cannot contain it. But we need those people coming into church. We need them finding Jesus. We need them to find the only one who can break through that mess and clean it off. Somebody gave me a, um, a picture when I was praying for somebody. They gave me a picture for this person that could really explain where they were at with God at the time. And it was a picture of somebody absolutely caked solid in layers and layers and layers and layers of mud to the point where they were like a statue, absolutely rigid in this mess, in this layers of caked on, solidified mud, where they could not move. And actually, that is so many of us. And we need to come before God and ask God to be the one that deals with those layers. And sometimes it will be a gentle um, washing <laughs> that will just maybe wash one layer off. Maybe it's a flooding that needs to really release a lot of it. Maybe it's actually a bit of chiseling, you know, actually to break through the solid stuff that is caked on us. But actually, if you see somebody covered with the hurt and mess, it looks disgusting. It looks horrid. It looks messy. And you may see a character that comes at you with all of that. But actually, what God wants is them to be loved so that that all comes and gets washed off. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit is the place to wash that off. And actually, if we're not seeing people come into church with their messiness of broken lives, are we really reaching people? If everybody that's new, that's walking through your door, is all lovely together and coming from another church, and they're kind of processing a lot of their stuff, they're fairly mature in their faith, then we're missing the lost community that desperately needs to know that Jesus is there for them in their mess. And actually, we need to be ready to encounter messy church. Because if we want people to know God, there's going to be a lot more messy people coming in. We had a word for the for Restore Church um, earlier in the year where Kate and Nicholson gave us a challenge that people had to get spare rooms ready because there were people to be housed. And God really challenged me in preparing that this, that it's more than that. We need to get our hearts ready. Are our hearts ready to be able to walk with somebody through their messy journey and walk with them to help them find freedom and to see what God has for them? 
In church, we're a family. Every family will have differences. You have different characters, different personalities, different preferences, different styles, different hurts, different experiences. And as a church family, we need to work out how to do that together. We do need a safe community as a church. We do need protocols and the right ways to raise concerns and to seek safety for people. We do need accountability for each of us and for the leaders. We need that in place. But actually, we also need to be ready to journey with people in their mess. For our 40th celebration, there's some brilliant videos. If you've not watched them yet, um, I would encourage you to go back and watch the history one particularly, um, because a couple of the quotes I'm going to lift from there. Mary Sutton, who was a leader of the Restore for a good sort of nearly 20 years, the quote that she shared that I've lifted from her is that the church is to look like Jesus. So anybody who comes in says, ah, that's who Jesus is. That's real love. That's real forgiveness. That's what grace looks like. Does our church look like that? Is that what people see when they walk in and see the body of us and who we are? Judy Lovell, another kind of hero of faith for me, who I've done a lot of life with and is an absolute amazing testimony of how to do life with messy people. Judy's heart is just so awesome for the messy people. And if you haven't got to know her, I would say find out more from Judy because she knows how to journey. Um, she shared a little bit in the video as well and she said, our lives are the Bible that people read. There are people around you that will never pick up a Bible, but they are looking at you. They're seeing you. Many will know you're a Christian and you have this faith and they're looking at you. They're looking at your day-to-day -day life. They are watching. You are the Bible of where they will see Jesus. She also lives her life by the quote of loving the gold out of people. And if you go back to that image of somebody absolutely caked in the solidified mud, Judy would always seek out what is behind that mud what has god put into that person that is the gold and the design of the person in there and she will love that person whatever mess and onslaught will come at her she will step into the holy spirit and keep loving them and loving them and guiding and correcting where needed but loving them first walking with them do we see people as Jesus sees them? Are we living in the Holy Spirit? Because it's really hard to do that without the Holy Spirit's wisdom. Are we looking through the mind of Christ and seeing people? There's a lady, Judy, worked in the community centre for many years. And she would have people in there that would be really hurting people. And maybe people that would come and every time come into this environment we were cultivating of a kind of cafe culture where people could just be in there all day, every day if they wanted to. But people would challenge Judy and go, how would you cope with these people that come in and seem to just cause upset, come swearing and aggressive or, or just seem to turn arguments, kind of creating them in your presence. And it is, it's about loving the gold. Judy would invest in that person and invest in that person and say that actually I know that God's put something more in them. And yes, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing the outside layers of mud. But actually if I crack through there is gold inside that will shine out. And the only way to get to that gold is to love through it and empower the Holy Spirit, <laughs> in Holy Spirit loving, to break and break and break through. And the, you saw those moments when the people that were the hardest ones to love, when the softening happened, and you could see the heart. You could see some of the, the nurturing gifting that God had put in that person, but had been so hurt, rejected, um, and so covered in trauma and pain that they couldn't feel safe to do that. And the moments that Judy saw where she's like, ah, that's some of the gold inside. 
that's what we're going to keep loving out. And I think that's a real challenge for us in the way that we journey and how we do church, but how we do life, looking through the eyes of Jesus, having the mind of Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit to see how other people are really designed. So what can we do? First of all, in terms of remembering that we're part of something bigger, we need to remember that the church is full of flawed humans. Every congregation member, every leader is purely human. We are doing our best. We are trying to function, but we, their mistakes will happen. Differences will come along. But we need to come with grace and peace that comes from God. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to equip them more and more and more to be that pioneer and leading us through in what the God wants for us. We need to be praying for others, and I would challenge you, pray for those that you find the hardest to get on with. Those that you feel bring the messiest bit, or actually pull the messiest bit of you out. Pray for them. Pray that you will see them as God sees them. I think if you do have concerns in a way a church is running, if you do feel that there are things that need to be addressed, you need to find a God-honouring way of addressing that. Pray first and then take it to the correct leadership uh, authorities in a compassionate way with love and grace and peace and come with them and say, I'm concerned about this. And then walk away and pray about it some more and entrust it to your leadership team. We do need that accountability. We do need that done well, but we need to not be rooting division. We need to be coming with, I'm with you. We want this to be one church. Let's work together. Our second part in terms of being united in sharing Jesus, how do we do this? And I think we need to address things in the appropriate manners and not be ones having conversations in the background about things. If you've got a concern, deal with it in an appropriate way. But also I think we need to be thinking, are we inclusive as a church? We are one church. Are we looking to include the messiest? Are we looking to invest ourselves in fully? I think particularly looking around, maybe on a Sunday morning as you meet and say, actually, who have I not connected with? Or who is looking like they're not connecting with many? I need to go out of my comfort zone and reach out to somebody else. We need to be keeping the priority about sharing Jesus and to see others as Jesus sees them. We also need to be alert of creating kind of exclusive groupings that actually we need to be looking out. There is a real importance in having accountability. There is a real importance in having good, strong friendships in church. But actually, if you are investing in those people at other points in the week, does Sunday morning need to be the time you invest in those relationships the most? There are other people that are desperately seeking what Jesus looks like. Where can you play your part to look out on a Sunday morning and be connecting with others? Are you really invested and connected into your church? Great way of doing that, particularly for us in Restore, we have some great small groups. We have service teams where you can get connected in. And that is a great way of going getting yourself connected into one body, remembering you are part of one thing, to share Jesus and what part do you have to play in that. I think also being mindful of phrases like, the church should. If you've got a concern about what the church should or shouldn't be doing, the church should is a really difficult phrase. Because actually, if you are part of that church, you, we, are the church. So if you're saying the church should do this, what do you need to do about it? Because to pass it on to somebody else, you are part of that body. What is your part to play? Connect with the leaders. Do it in the right way. With grace and peace and love and empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
bring those things and say, okay, this is really stirring in my heart. What can we do? What can I do? How can I fit into this to make this work? Thirdly, and for me, this is probably the meatiest one, the heavy one for us. The third part that Paul was emphasising on was living in the Holy Spirit. I know we've mentioned a bit about seeing other people through the Holy Spirit, but also another part that God was emphasising to me in this is that when we're moving in the Holy Spirit, it's about maturing in the Holy Spirit, like Paul encouraged us in chapter 3. Are we maturing in the Holy Spirit? Are we acknowledging our own messiness and not just acknowledging it, but actually in maturing, dealing with it, moving on, addressing it? Are we forgiving those who've hurt us? Are we repenting from when we've hurt others? Are we repenting from when we've criticised or hurt the church? Have we established good accountability where people can go, don't think you handled that right, actually. But that has to come out of love. We can't bring accountability if you haven't invested love into that relationship. And are we getting our hearts ready to journey with messy people? Because if we want the world to know that there is a Jesus that brings salvation and healing, then we're going to have to be ready to journey with those people. We had the 40th celebration at Restore. And there was a significant moment of the evening of that um, that I have got permission with Ian and Vaynard to share with you. But Ian at that moment took a deliberate time to stand in front of those present and to address the fact that in the 40 years of history, there have, as in any family, been times that were great, times to be celebrated, but also times where as a church or leaders got it wrong and acted in ways that were not like Jesus. He really had the sense, and I know a number of us did, that there would be people who couldn't join that celebration because of hurt they had encountered in the past. And actually, Ian took a moment to stand, I think Neil actually, repented as the current senior leader of behalf of every act of leadership that fallen short of what it could have been over the 40 years, whether it was by Ian himself or by other leaders within the history of the church. He then prayed that God would forgive him and the leadership for those shortcomings. He then sought and prayed a blessing on all of those who've been hurt over the years and that God would bless and heal and restore them. And I want to say as somebody sharing it on behalf of Ian that that apology stands, that um, repentance is there and that prayer of blessing and healing is for all those who've been hurt under leadership of Restore. If you're hearing this as a leader coming from another church or history of hurt from another church, then as somebody representing church leadership here, I want to say we're sorry for where you've been hurt. Leaders are humans and leaders make mistakes. And there does need to be a level of accountability to that, absolutely. But we are flawed humans. And we want to say sorry for where pain has been inflicted. And I pray now for a healing of hearts that are hurting. I pray, God, you would help people to journey through the forgiveness so that they can be released from this pain and be restored to all that you have designed for them. In Jesus' name. Following on from that moment at the celebration, we had Vinny, who's now stepping into one of uh, the eldership roles and had been a congregation member for a number of years. And actually... He stood up as a congregational member and he said that he wanted himself to apologise for where he had taken offence by leadership decisions and actions and where he had criticised Ian directly and the leadership team in the past. He asked for Ian's and for God's forgiveness and they sought reconciliation. And what I love is that we have watched um, Vinnie and Ian journey this together. They have sought to 
um, apologise and repent and forgive and sought to reconcile that relationship. And I think there's an element where we will each carry mess, we each carry some hurt or pain or unforgiveness of something. Um, and forgiveness is a really difficult one. And actually, we really could do another whole hour's talk about forgiveness. But I, what I want to particularly, kind of coming towards the end of this um, talk, is share with you a quick image about forgiveness. Some of you would have heard this analogy. It's not my own. It's stolen from everywhere else that uses it. But actually, there are times where each of us are hurt, and that pain comes in. And that pain is justified and it's, it's natural and it's normal pain that when we are hurt, it comes in. But actually, we then have a choice when we're carrying that pain to either take offence or to release that pain and seek forgiveness. And actually, when we take offence, there's this lovely imagery, there we go, of putting offence up. So actually, when we choose, intentionally or not, but when we've subconsciously taken a choice to hold on to that pain, we build a fence. And then if we reflect on it again, we might end up saying, oh, yeah, but I was really hurt, and they haven't asked for forgiveness, and it's really digging deep, and it wasn't just. We're building another fence, and we're reinforcing our fence, and we're making our fence stronger and thicker and barriers and barriers. And what we're actually doing is creating this barrier between us and the person and between us and God because we are keeping the pain in our heart and kind of barriering it in. And what we actually, we have the choice, whether someone asks for forgiveness or not, we can have a choice as to whether we hold on to this pain or not. You don't need somebody to come to you and apologise to you, for you to choose to put the fence down and for you to ask the Holy Spirit to deal with the pain and heal it. And you can break off the tie from the person that's hurt you or maybe you feel there are things that God's done to hurt you. You can choose to break that off on your part and um, invite the Holy Spirit to heal the wound and the hurt that we're sitting there. As you know with wounds and injuries, if we keep them open, like a surgical wound, if you kept to keep it open, it's going to fester, it's going to infect, it's going to cause problems. And the Bible is full of examples of saying, deal with the pain and the hurt. Give it to God. Choose to not put the fence up. But actually choose to put it down. And sometimes we can process through that forgiveness and we think that we've dealt with it with God. And then a reminder comes in. Or the devil, the enemy will kind of go, yeah, but what about? And again, you'll have to make that choice. Am I putting this fence up again? Oh, yeah. That did hurt, actually. Or we're saying, God, yeah, it hurt, but I don't want to hold on to that pain. Help me to pass it on. Give it over to you. Lay it at the cross and walk in the freedom. I think for me, I think that's my big challenge for me. I don't know about you. Just to really guard my heart against those pains. So in terms of addressing the potential of division and disunity in a church, there were three parts that Paul really um, emphasised for us. Remember we're part of something bigger. Pray for the church, pray for your leaders, pray for those that you struggle with. We need to be united in sharing Jesus. We need to see others as Jesus sees them and we need to be prepared to journey with them in their mess being all that we can be, showing Jesus to them. And we need to live in the Holy Spirit, being empowered by the Holy Spirit to see people, but also to deal with our own mess so that we're ready to journey. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your church. Father God, I thank you for the church that I'm a part of. I thank you for each and every member and I pray, Father God, for your grace and your peace to be on our global church as well as our local church. 
And God, I pray that you will challenge in us today. Where do we need to deal with our own mess? Where do we need to be walking more in the Holy Spirit to see others as you see them, to love the gold out of that messy, mud-covered person in front of me? And God, where do I need to deal with the mess and the mud that's covering me? Where do I need to put down the fence and choose to seek after you? Holy Spirit, reveal to us and journey with us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd encourage you before you rush away onto the next thing, when you turn this off, stop for just two, three minutes and just seek God and say, God, what do I need to do right now in this? Thank you for listening. Have an amazing time and I pray loads of blessings on you.